Hi everyone and uh, welcome along to this talk um, around informing cloud native vulnerability management from views from the past. You know we've got a lot of talks uh, over the course of this conference looking at the future, right? Looking at where we're going and how things are going to happen. Um, and I thought it might be interesting as a kind of adjunct to that to take a bit of a look at the past and say what are the th some of the things that we've seen uh, in vulnerability management, uh, in security management in the past that might help us inform and design those things in the future. Um, a key point before we start is the ideas in this presentation are my own, not necessarily the views of any employer, past, present or future. This is something I've kind of been looking at over many different jobs, so it's not necessarily the view of any one company. So to talk a little bit about my history, why I think you know that I might have some interesting, interesting ideas for this. Um, I've been in information and IT security uh, for about 22 years now. Uh, I started in financial services uh, as an analyst. And I also then managed uh, internal penetration testing services for a number of financial services companies in the UK. Uh, and so I did a lot of vulnerability scanning, a lot of vulnerability analysis work, a lot of working with the business to get things patched. Um, I then spent quite a lot of time as a, um, a pen tester, as a pen testing consultant. And I've done hundreds, probably actually thousands of pen tests of a variety of types, infrastructure work, wireless work, web application work, and recently a lot of container work. Um, and I've also done some work around the kind of vulnerability disclosure space, helping find and disclose multiple CVEs. Um, and I'm a member of Kubernetes Security and CNCF Tag Security. Uh, unfortunately, I obviously wasn't able to be there at the conference uh, in person. Um, I actually stay here, uh, which is Loch Goyle Head in the West Scottish Highlands, which, as you can see, looks very pretty in uh, when it's not raining. Uh, if you ever come to the West Scottish Highlands, I'm afraid it'll look probably, you won't be able to see those hills and there'll be a lot of rain in the way. But it is very nice when the sun's out. Anyway, so lessons from the past. Why would we, um, why would we want, want to think about the past when we're looking forward? Well, the first thing to get out of the way is that I'm not saying that, that nothing should change. I think there's a concern when every people start bringing up the past that they're going to say, hey, nothing should change. Things work well in the, in, in the past. We shouldn't mess with it. I don't think that's the case. I think we do need to very much change how we do uh, vulnerability management, how we do uh, um, security uh, for a cloud native world. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't look at the past and look at some of the things that went well and badly and use them to try and inform um, what it is that we're going to do in the future. And I think that's where it's always a good idea when you do these things to kind of take a bit of time to step back and do that. So. The first one, uh, the first theme that I wanted to talk about was openness, because I think openness is critically important. And obviously, this is an open source conference, so this is going to be a key value anyway. But I think we can talk about why um, and some of the ways where openness is very important. The first one is um, I take from my time in, in security testing, which is when we would do assessments, uh, either as an internal team or an external team, you would often find that some other uh, group would also do an assessment, right? And they'd be using a different vulnerability scanner product. And then when they did this, you would get a different list of vulnerabilities. You might get different severities. You might get a different number of vulnerabilities. And this was a problem, right? Because you've told a business group, hey, you've got, you know, 50 vulnerabilities. Uh, the highest is 10 highs. And then someone comes along and says, actually, you've got 75 and there's 15 highs. And the business says to you, well, which is these right? And the answer comes down to its differences in how the scanners worked. If those scanners aren't open, if they're closed source, if they're proprietary, if you, or even worse, if they're SaaS, so you really can't see what they're doing, you have a difficult time answering that question in a lot of cases. You can't actually say, actually, you know what, we can tell what's going on here, and it's this. One of the things I see as a great positive of some of the work that's being done at the moment in container vulnerability management uh, with products like Gripe and Truvy is that they're open source. If you want to know why a different result was received, you can go and look. And they do produce different results in some cases for sure. Um, but if you need to actually find that out from a business reason, you can go and actually look at the source code and look at how they do their work and come up with some kind of answer. So I think that's great. And I think we should be encouraging that openness um, so that we can actually see what's going on and actually make sure those comparisons, because it helps us um, build confidence uh, with business people in the fact that we are telling them, you know, we have some basis for why we're telling them that specific vulnerabilities are in place. I think the other aspect of openness that I think is very important um, is about getting visibility of all the vulnerabilities. In the old enterprise world, um, one of the things that was increasingly popular over my time in financial services was appliances. Uh, um, and appliances were essentially treated as black boxes. You, know, you weren't able to get access to them to find out what packages were installed. In most cases, you weren't able to find out what vulnerabilities were present. And to an extent, 
um, honestly, it, business is like that, right? Because it was a system they didn't have to manage. It was the vendor's responsibility to manage packages and to manage patch management. Now, in reality, this is a false economy because the vulnerabilities are still present, the packages are still installed. It's just you don't have any visibility of what's going on, so you can't assess the risk of them. And I think, obviously, as time has gone by, companies have realized this. Um, you know, there's a problem here, and we need to make sure that we have some idea of what is going on inside of those black boxes so that we can have an accurate or a more accurate picture of the risks and vulnerabilities that we face. But if we look at cloud native and how cloud is developing, one of the things that's very obvious is the um, popularity of SaaS services. So where a company will essentially just subscribe to a service and they'll send their data to it and it'll get processed in whatever way and, and put back. And that essentially is similar to my mind to the way appliances work. A SaaS service is a black box. You don't know what software is in use in most cases. You don't know what packages are in use or what versions. So from that perspective, um, I think that we need to think about how can we make that more open? How can we um, you know, make sure that we're not essentially just hiding the vulnerabilities uh, in another company's network or another company's environment? Or if we are, how are we assessing the risks of that? Because that's a challenge for us. Um, so I think openness, to my mind anyway, is very important. And I think the more, um, the more open we can be, um, the better it's going to be, the more confidence we'll build in, in what we're doing. This one, um, ending the tyranny of the CVE. Um, now, I don't want to, to this come off as a slam on CVEs. I think CVEs are great. I think having a unique identifier for a vulnerability is a great thing because it helps people discuss that issue. Uh, and having something to do that with is, is great. But there are a couple of ways in which, um, in which CVEs can be essentially a kind of a, a problem. And, and, and I'll explain what those might be. Um, the first one is that there is, um, there is a, some tendency to, um, to say that if there isn't a CVE present, then there's no, no problem, right? It's not tracked uh, and it's not necessarily prioritized. So end user companies don't look at things or know things unless they have a CVE assigned to them. And that's a problem because there are things that don't get CVEs that are definitely something companies should be aware of from a risk perspective. An example of that is um, Kubernetes security audit. So there were multiple uh, high rated security uh, findings in the 2019 Kubernetes security audit that haven't been fixed. Um, at the same time, if you look back over the last three years of the Kubernetes project, there have been a number of CVs that at the very least get a bulletin uh, with workarounds and in the vast majority of cases get a patch as well. But those things in the audit didn't have a CVE. So I think there wasn't as much pressure necessarily for them to get fixed, whereas things with a CVE get pressure to get fixed. So I think that aspect of, um, of CVEs is an important one and something that we need to uh, look at. The other one is that I think there's a problem where CVEs are seen as a bad thing. Right? So if I have a CVE, that's in somehow a black mark on my project. And then we want to be careful of that. Because you'll get people making false equivalences. They'll say things like, oh, well, this doesn't have any CVEs, and therefore um, it's a good secure product, which is not correct. If you look at things like, for example, IBM mainframes. So IBM have a published policy that they do not issue CVEs for security issues in their mainframe products. They don't say that that means they have no security problems. However, I have seen it said by some people in the industry that, hey, there's no CVs, it must be super secure. That's not true. It's just the fact that they don't do that, use that system. Um, another aspect I've seen this with is projects, open source projects, who don't want a CV assigned because they're concerned it's going to be a black mark. Um, and that leads to um, sometimes the things being raised in inappropriate projects or not being raised at all. And again, it reduces this tracking. So when we're thinking about how we design the future, um, Having, there's a couple of things I think we could look at. We could look at the idea of having something which is wider than just straight up vulnerabilities. So things like, for example, where security um, architecture decision might be tracked, because then you can say here is actually something which is relevant to your risk, Mr. End User Company, um, and you should know about it. And maybe there's not going to be a patch or fix for it, but you should still know about it. We also need to try as much as possible to get away from the idea that there's some downside to CVEs, right? Or to vulnerabilities, having a vulnerability for, you know, every product has got decisions or coding bugs, there's no such thing as non-buggy code. So everyone's going to have security relevant bugs. And I think it's important to try and normalize the idea that that's fine. It's a good thing. The important part is that there's a process. These things are found quickly, tracked as well as possible and fixed where people have got time and resources. So I think that's one of the things to keep in mind there. And then the last one is, um, well, not everyone is going to be as interested as us. And an important point here is that I'm not saying that um, I'm not saying that uh, um, end user companies aren't interested in security. 
what I am saying is that they've got a lot of things to think about. They've got a lot of priorities pressing on them, things they have to do with their time. And vulnerability management and patch management isn't necessarily always going to be at the top. When we are designing systems for the future, um, having that in mind, I think, is an important one. Because if we design something that requires an awful lot of effort from those companies to do to work well, probably won't get used that well. And there's a couple of, uh, of examples from my time that I think were relevant. The first one is that um, as a pen tester in the UK, um, there's a very common thing, which is an annual pen test. So a company will essentially do a review uh, every year and they'll look at the same scope. So they'll look at a network, a system or the entire environment. If you're doing a pen test for the second, third, fourth year, you would bring along the report from the previous year, uh, open it up and run down the list of findings to check to see if they're still present. I many times have had the experience of some or indeed even all of the of the findings from the previous year just not being fixed. Tests have been done, but they haven't actually fixed the findings because presumably they just didn't have the resources and time or prioritize it to actually get that done. So there's a key thing there, which is, you know, people aren't as interested in that, in that sense uh, um, as we would be. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, that, that's something uh, to think about. The other thing is that we look at something like CVSS temporal scores. Um, you know, there's this thing you can add on to CVSS. Where I've seen, um, you know, people managing lots of vulnerabilities, and you think about container security world, where you might have, you know, thousands or even tens of thousands of container images. Something where you have to do it manually for every vulnerability uh, and actually do an analysis probably isn't going to happen, right? Because realistically speaking, the, they don't have the kind of person resources available to actually do that kind of work. So trying to steer clear of anything um, which actually needs that kind of work, I think is an important one. And I think something that would help us. So um, to conclude uh, um, this talk, I think it's great to see the renewed effort or see the, the effort that we've got going into improving this space. I think it's um, vital that we do take this time to consider and to work out how we can best apply good security practices, good vulnerability management practices to the cloud native and cloud world. Um, I think looking at it, uh, um, trends like improved openness, so having things done in the open where we can actually analyze what's going on and everyone knows how things are done is fantastic because I think it enables us to demonstrate to business people that we're actually finding things and why we found them. You know, we're just, we're just telling them something, we actually have a reason for it. Um, I think that's very important. I think we do have work to do in terms of making sure it's as open as possible and that we reduce as much as possible those kind of black boxes where you don't know what's going on because you can't assess your risk well if you don't know what's inside the box. Um, I think as we're thinking about how we identify vulnerabilities, anything we can do to um, to widen the scope and say it's not just necessarily bugs, but maybe other things as well, and we have those things tracked uh, and assessed and scored and prioritized will be good as well so that we're not too focused on things that count as CVEs. And I also think that um, I think we need to be con conscious of time, right? Conscious of resources. Designing systems needs to take the user into account. That's one of the first precepts of any system design. Uh, end user companies have a level of resources available for this kind of thing. And anything we can do with new systems to try and make it as easy for them as possible to adopt it is going to be a win. Um, you want to have that detail there so that you know if someone does want to dig, dive in and you know has the time and resources that they can do that but you also want to have a path for people who have limited amount of resources available for this kind of work so thanks very much uh, um, for the, taking the time to listen to this talk um, if you want to uh, get in contact with me afterwards um, I am available on Twitter uh, as at Racine and my email address is there on the screen uh, and hopefully you will enjoy the rest of the conference